Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts are hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. my least favorite books I ever read was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, because I think it's all small stuff. And then secondly, I'm so glad you made that comment about my book is not trying to be transformational. It's not this global solution. You know, it, it is those little tiny things. And I never really thought about it in these terms, but if you think about, like you put your money into an investment, and I'm not a math guy, so I'll probably get this all wrong, but if you were to get 4% a year on your investments, over a 30-year period, and I was to get 5%, it would seem like a small difference, right? But I'd probably have double or triple what you'd have at the end of the 30 years, which seems counterintuitive. And so it is those small little things that day after day after day, they compound in your life. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Steve Hers. Steve's the author of a book titled, Don't Take Yes for an Answer, Using Authority, Warmth, and Energy to Get Exceptional Results. And as well, he's the founder of IF Management and president of the Montag Group, which is a leading agency representing top broadcast news and sports talent, many names that you'd easily recognize. Now, in this conversation with Steve, we talk about personal development. You know, Steve believes that we get a lot of positive feedback that we don't actually deserve which means that you can't trust all the yeses that you hear. So that's the topic we'll discuss today. You know, in this age of everybody gets a trophy, it could be the lack of honest feedback that's holding you back from performing at the level that you desire. We also dig into what I thought was one of the real key takeaways of his book, which I happen to wholeheartedly agree with, which is that the difference between being good and great is actually quite narrow. We'll talk about some of the ways you can span that gap. Now, as many of you know, I think we do a real disservice to people who are looking to change in all of the personal development books by emphasizing transformation. What I love about Steve's book and this discussion we get into is why it's the small changes that make the difference. So, all that and much, much more before we get to Steve, I have a short message for you. This, this episode is being released on Thanksgiving Day. I want to thank everyone who has worked so hard to produce nearly 850 episodes of the show to date. I want to thank everyone who listens to the show. Without you, we are nothing. We're humbled by your support, and we'll work hard to continue to earn your attention for future shows. All right, let's jump into it with Steve. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andy. Happy to be here. Well, pleasure to have you here. So uh, where have you been hanging out during the whole pandemic? For the last six months, I've been out on Long Island near uh, Southampton, about two hours from where I normally live, which is uh, Manhattan. Got it. So... Are your kids still there? Are they getting ready to go to school? Or have they gone back to school? Or My kids are in school two days a week via actual classes and three days a week via Zoom. This week, they only have three hours of in school. So my wife took them back just for a day. She's coming back tomorrow. And um, then come Sunday, we'll go back together. And then who knows what we'll do after that. We might just stay in the city after, at that point. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it sounds like uh, my wife just came back from spending I don't know, about a month in, in Manhattan and just said that people are much better about wearing their masks there than they are here in California. Yeah, it's a strange thing. New Yorkers, for some reason, I feel like have done a really good job after the initial hit that we took. And it's not typical of New Yorkers to be so obedient, for lack of a better word. <laughs> but I think the thing about New York that I've found, and I've lived there 10 years now, is, is that they pull together well. You're right about that. It's in the DNA, I think. Yeah, I mean, because so many people in such a small space that if you don't pull together, it's just chaos. And it may look to chaos like chaos to people that don't live there, but you know, I always find it's just amazing. Sort of the rhythm. You know, people always talk about you know people walking, jaywalking across the lights, and so on. It's like 
this is just part of the rhythm of Sydney. If it didn't happen, it would just be gridlock. Right, right. That's a good observation. I agree with you. So I love asking this question of guests. Is, so what do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned about yourself during the pandemic? Wow, that's a really good question. I think I learned that I didn't need to be on this crazy treadmill that I've been on for the last 53, well, now I'm 54. I turned 54 during this pandemic. I think it was a really, it was a very humbling lesson about life, about what's important, about what, how you spend your time and what you think is important, what it isn't. And, you know, spending these last six months every single day, basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week with my wife and my kids in it was great. I mean, I have to say, I've really enjoyed it. I, I feel like I know my kids better for the last six months than I did for the last, they're 11 and 13 for all those years combined. Mm-hmm. And I really cherish that time. And obviously there's a lot about COVID that's horrible. And I would never want to say this publicly, although I am right now, there's a lot about <laughs> it that's been really, for me personally, it's really, it's really given me a new perspective on things. I hope I can keep it. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, yeah, do you think you can keep it? I think I can as long as, you know, I can make it a habit, you, you know, like just to not do things to just keep yourself busy all the time by by kind of getting back on that hamster wheel. Yeah. Well, I sort of, I did something similar when my kids were of similar age. I mean, they were 10 and 12, is I'd been you know, working for mostly startups, but uh, fast growth startups and traveling constantly around the world. And, and yeah, I, I stepped off the hamster wheel when I said they were 10, 12 and 10. And yeah, until they graduated high school, yeah, I was that guy that was <laughs> people I took pity on, but I was at every, every game, every recital, every, every kid event. Um, I think I was the only parent that saw all of them. And yeah, then when they graduate high school, went back at it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's funny. I, I, one of the things I watched on Netflix in the time that this pandemic happened was a biography documentary about Garth Brooks. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, ha- I happened to be living in Nashville from 1988 to 1991 when I was going to law school at literally the exact moment that Garth Brooks came onto the scene. It was the right. exact same time. So I've always been a fan of his. But I never knew that he quit country music, literally quit. And took uh, like a ten, a thirteen year break to raise his three yeah. daughters while he was divorced, yeah. and they they lived in the same house, he and his wife, or the same property. And uh, I have a lot of respect for what he did, and it was just odd, odd to watch that during this pandemic. Yeah, I can just speak for myself. As I no regrets for taking that time. I mean, I'm sure there was impacts from a you know career and monetary standpoint, but you never get those. You said you never get that time back. So there was plenty of time. Yeah. To restart it and created a whole new journey when I went back to it. So uh, hopefully you can stick with it. Right. I hope so. Your book will help you do that. So we're going to talk about your book. Sure. Don't take yes for an answer. Uh, using authority, warmth, and energy to get exceptional results. And I uh, enjoyed the book because it, it speaks to actually a couple themes that I talk a lot about <laughs> to the sales community on this on this podcast. So you wrote that. That basically, we all get a lot of positive feedback that basically we don't deserve, and which means that we all get a lot of yeses that we really can't trust. And I thought, isn't that the case? So why do you think that is? I think it's a lot of different reasons. I, th- I think number one, it's just look th- when you talk about feedback, you're giving someone else your opinion, and to give someone a less than positive opinion is a risk. You know, if I tell you, Andy, I don't love your show. There are three things about it I would do differently. That's a risk for me to do that. I don't know that you want to hear Mm -hmm. that. First of all, I don't know that I'm right. It's just my opinion. Secondly, you don't know that I'm right. And so it could become a very awkward conversation. And it's really not my place to tell you how to have a better show. And I'm I'm just using that metaphorically, of course, you know, sure. Um, because you love the show, obviously. I do, actually. I, I was just telling you before the show. I really, I, 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 but to prepare for you, I, I listened to a few different shows, and I, I, I certainly loved the most recent one I listened to with Karen Hurt. I thought it was fascinating. So I, I really do like the show, and I like your style. You have a very laid back interviewing style, which is which is refreshing. But um, anyway, going back to the point is that if you think about it, people um, 
it's, it's your job to kind of seek out the feedback, not to ask someone else to give it to you. And so it really opens up the door for that. Because if you're not opening up the door for it, then people are just going to tell you what you want to hear. Because why should they take that risk? It's, there's nothing for them to gain from it. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because you're one of a number of guests I spoke to recently that sort of on the same theme, which is that, and I'll sort of summarize it by saying is that it's a f- sort of fool's errand to expect that you know, in the context of working for a company that people in the company will give you the the sort of honest feedback that you need. And you illustrate this with several stories in your <laughs> your your book about individuals that you were working with or coaching who uh, you're being told on one level, yeah, you're doing fine, and then they're getting fired because they actually weren't performing that well. Right. And and it, I guess the, the theme being is that as individuals is that you can't sit around and wait for this this honest feedback to come from from a company. Is you need to be my, very much more self directed in terms of assessing yourself and taking action to improve. Yeah, because I, I think that because we have this culture, and I lay out some of the other reasons why in the book, so I'll just to... Well, yeah, I like some of those, yes. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I'll just, I, I think there's... I lay out three reasons for it, and I'll, I'll give you a fourth as well. So the three prime reasons, I think, for this kind of lack of feedback culture is one, you have this great inflation that's permeated society. And through nobody's fault, there's a lot of reasons for it. I describe in the book, it's become a consumer culture in academia. The second, mm-hmm. the second thing is that you have this participation trophy culture that's really blown up in the last 30, 40 years. And you, it's kind of morphed into an MVP trophy, whereas you know it's really good for someone to go and try out for the baseball team, what have you. But don't think you're the MVP just because you're playing right field and batting ninth. And then the last thing is this, where it's really happened in corporate America, by and large, companies don't want to fire you anymore. They don't even want to tell you you're fired. They will give you a reorg or a downsizing or all these euphemisms for saying it, it wasn't you, it's me. And then you never know what you could have done better. And then the last thing is, I just think there's this mentality out there of this idea of no judgments. Who am I to judge you? And there, there is some truth to that. But if you're never being judged in terms of what someone's saying to you and giving you feedback, then you're ignorant to the fact that you are being judged. We're all being judged all the time, subconsciously and otherwise. And so, you know, people, it's a competitive world. And if some company thinks that they can get a better employee than you, or you're, you can find a better doctor, better dentist, better lawyer, better whatever, better customer service provider, just know that you're being judged all the time and don't pretend that it's not happening because it is. Yeah. And I think, those reasons you gave, I really like, is yeah, you know, yeah, the participation trophy, uh, and I think there's a theme that sort of ties them together. The great inflation and so on is is that it's like we've we've decided that everybody needs to be a superstar, yes. and that that it's like it's no longer enough just to be good. Right, and you read sales books; they're they're full of this. Right, it's how do you become a top performer? And it's like, oh, come on, there's <laughs> there's a thin layer of people at the top, and everybody else is either sort of above average or average or maybe below average. But it's like good has become a pejorative. I agree with you, and, and it, you're right. The other and the other one I would add to this is that sort of sort of plays in this, I think, is this whole idea of the helicopter parenting, which is that there's a couple of generations that are sort of come of age in this environment where they sort of expect people in a position of authority to kind of rescue them. Right, right. I, I, I think it is, I don't think, maybe in your podcast or someone else, someone was talking about how you can clear the path for the boy, or you can, you can prepare the path for the boy, or you can prepare the boy for the path. And too many people, and I, I said this to my wife, and she yelled at me for saying it to her. She denied it, which is kind of funny. Maybe she's right. Maybe I'm doing it. But I think sometimes we do it with our kids. We're preparing the path too much instead of preparing the children. And mm-hmm. it's tempting. It's very tempting. But um, I think you have to avoid that temptation. And I think, to your point, that mentality has gone into the business world now, too. We don't think people can handle it. 
So we secretly, right. we secretly hide it from them and then we just get rid of them. Some, a major company, a head of HR, an executive vice president in the C-suite of a company that has 400,000 employees told me off the record, we don't fire people anymore. We don't even want it, our laggard employees to know that they were, they were pushed out. We stealthily get rid of them. That's what he said, stealthily. Huh. I take it it's not GE because they were famous in Jack Walsh, you know, in the bottom 20 or left every year, were excused. Right, right. It was not GE. Yeah. Well, I just, it, some people have written that this is, uh, what we're seeing is sort of a response uh, from the boomers who are raised differently and socialized differently that, that uh, they didn't get feedback at all, nor did they expect it, right? They're basically told what to do and, and did it uh, in the workplace. And yeah, I wonder if that's something you've picked up in your research or not. I mean, I, I actually didn't find it to be that much different from the baby boomers to this generation. I think this mm-hmm. mentality, and maybe it's just because now this mentality has taken root in corporate America for probably 15 or 20 years at this point, and it's taking more and more root. So whether you're, like I said, I'm 54 or, or you're 30, it's a mindset that I think it affects everybody. Yeah, it's become the dominant culture. But it's this interesting conundrum: is that that at the same time, this is as you're saying, this is sort of the culture, corporate culture, corporate culture that's evolving and has evolved. Is like Gallup has done surveys of sales professionals, and you know the number one reason they change jobs is they're looking for you know they're looking for an opportunity to develop. They're looking for somebody to help them, you know, sort of not. You know, prepare them for the path, as you talked about, um, and they're not getting it. And so what we see is, at least in the sales world, is, is a lot of churn because people are, are seeking this but not, not getting it. And on the other hand, what you're saying is that companies are sort of saying, well, we're trying not to provide that. You're right. And, and, and it's funny because you, you, you did talk about this in that other podcast where I thought was interesting is it's the difference between a qualitative approach and a quantitative approach. And if you just tell people, oh, you know, get 10 leads or close this amount of business, that's a very quantitative approach. And I think, and I think you would agree, that's not the way to build a sustainable, lasting, excellent business. The, mm-hmm, the sustainable mm-hmm. way to do it is through qualitative approach, like Karen said on that podcast. You know, how was the phone call? How was the interaction with the person? How did you react to the to them? If you teach people a process and a qualitative approach, then it's replicable and it's teachable and it's coachable through an organization. But that's difficult, and I think there are still some great companies that are doing that. And I, but at the end of the day, what really matters, in my opinion, isn't we're talking about the macro, right? We're in this kind of very right. big macro conversation. But my book is really about the micro. And I don't yeah. think it's possible for me to change the macro. And I'm not even going to try to change the macro because it's not where I want to put my energy. What I'm hoping is that the person who's listening to this podcast is going to think, well, I'm an individual on the micro level, and this is affecting me. And what do I do about it? And if my company isn't going to have the culture or the courage to tell me what I want to hear, what I'm sorry, tell me what I need to hear instead of what I want to hear, then I got to go seek that out. And that's what I'm hoping is that people will read my book and have a mindset shift about how they should be functioning in the world and not get lulled into this false sense of security, because that's the only thing that matters, in my opinion. Well, I I agree 100%. And one of the reasons I really enjoyed the book is – I mean, I just guy agreed with it and aligns with my philosophy. But but you wrote that that you know, the good news is a quote is the good news is that the space between good and great can be quite narrow. Often a small tweak, a gentle adjustment. And and I agree. I mean, I think that in general, if we look at people say in the sales world, who people listening to this this uh, podcast, is that yeah, they've all been sort of generally similarly trained they're similarly skilled um you know they operate i think within a sort of a narrow band of proficiency and i think what change what's the difference between some people and the other is their perspective right that it could be just a one one percent one degree shift in perspective makes all the difference i i agree and i i want to just build on that for a moment because it, if you don't mind, it goes into the second part of my book, which is about this whole idea of awe, authority, warmth, and mm-hmm. energy. And I think that I was talking to a friend of mine today, and we were, we were complimenting this guy that we knew in common who was a 
bond trader, and then he left the bond trading world. His name is John Sessler, and now he owns a olive oil and food company called Zoe. And huh? and 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 I, I we're both saying how he's an impressive guy, but he kind of he has kind of an aw shucks way about himself. You know, he's just you would never know he was so hard driving, and he has this quality that he never gets angry. He's always smiling and he has a, a very good demeanor. And I think that that's what makes him very successful as a salesperson because he keeps it positive. He keeps it light. And mm -hmm. you, you never see that frustration in, in, in his demeanor, in his face, in his body language. And it's just a great quality to have. And I think that that's what I'm trying to say to people in this book is some of your communication behaviors are what's going to make or break you or make the difference between good to great or mediocre to good, et cetera. And these are the things we're not really thinking about, you know, and, and, and I have a problem, frankly, I don't do that. I, I need to work on that. I, I get angry and frustrated sometimes and show it too much. And that's the fastest way to turn off a potential customer or a current customer, you know? Right. And so just practicing that and practicing this, I call it under the, the rubric of a warmth, you know, connect connection. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can practice that, that's going to have a very significant uh, outcome for you over time. Well, I like the way you, you talk about it in terms really of consistency, right? Is is you know you have the statement that you know our, our reputation stems not only from how we talk and behave and present ourselves when we're in front of a prospect, but also how we behave, speak, and do the same things during. Well, I sort of summarized it when when people aren't looking. Right, yeah, perhaps exactly. the, the small everyday interactions we have, and so on, and and so as I was reading, and you're talking about AWE, and we'll get into that uh, authority, warmth, and energy. Is is really we're talking about character? It seems like to me. I mean, it's it's and it's a word that's not. It's like we shy away from when we use the word character. I think oftentimes when we talk about personal development, but it isn't that really what you're describing. It's it's interesting. I'm going to give you the worst answer you've ever gotten on a podcast. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's fine. I don't know because I, I haven't really thought about it in terms of character. I I, I actually I, I, I'm going to disagree with you for a moment. I, sure. I, I think it is character. It is character. You're right. But I think you could have two people with almost identical characters, right? You can both mm -hmm. be really decent people and you can have the same values. But one person might develop what I would call a bad communication habit because let's say I grew up in a household where there was a lot of screaming and yelling going on and anger was part of the normal course of you know, communication. And I think so much mm -hmm. of the way we communicate is just through imitation, right? And then sure. another guy grows up in a household and there's no anger and there's no screaming and yelling. And the only way to kind of combat someone yelling and screaming is to just have this really amazing social jujitsu way of taking the temperature down. But you, so you can have two people with identical characters and yet one's going to be a much more successful salesperson because they lack that negative trait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, again, I'm not sure if I had to dig deeper, I, you, I may find out that, that you're actually right. <laughs> well, it's just when I was reading that particular section of the book, is it just called to mind this this quote from John Wooden that I remembered, which is in turn derived from a quote from C.S. Lewis, which is uh, Wooden's quote was the true test of a person's character is what he does when no one is watching. Right, that's and, true, and and I think that's a lot of what you're describing is is it's these habits we have when we're not on stage talking to a prospect or an existing client or whatever. It's the way we treat and work with people and present ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives that, that um, makes the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny. I, I, I sometimes think this is probably not the best way to try to sell a book, but I feel like this book in particular is not really for everybody, right? It's really for people that I think are already doing a lot of things right and then still yes. can't figure out why they haven't gotten to that even good level, whatever good means for you, right? Because I know you talk mm -hmm. about good and great. And, and you know, look, there are people out there who they just know in their heart of hearts, they just haven't remotely come close to reaching their potential. And they're good people. They worked hard. They got a good education. They show up on time. They might even have good ideas. But I think it's that bucket of and, – and by the way, they also have good character. But they just – maybe there's just a communication 
a flaw that they have that's really just holding them back. And they're, they're just so blind to it, they don't even know why. Well, and that's one of the, I think one of the really valuable things about the book is that you give lots of examples of these small, call them small things that I, said, I love the small things. Because I think if, yeah, I, I talk about this idea of the aggregation of marginal gains, which is something that came out of uh, the sports world. But, uh, you know, where are the areas you can make these small improvements, just right. 1% maybe, that in aggregate make a difference? And so, so often, and I think in self help books and or books we're trying to teach people is it's this idea that you have to transform completely the way you are. And that's one of the things I enjoyed about your book is is that no, you're talking about these paying attention to these small things that have an outsized impact over time. I'm so happy you said that because two things. First of all, one of my least favorite books I ever read was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Because I think mm-hmm. it's it's all small stuff. It's and, all small stuff, exactly. And, and then secondly, I'm so glad you came, you 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 made that comment about my book is not trying to be transformational. It's not this global solution, and it, 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 you know it's it's it is those little tiny things. And, and I I never really thought about it in these terms, but if you think about like you put your money into uh, into an investment, and and I'm not a math guy, so I'll probably get this all wrong, but. If, if, if you were to get 4% a year on your investments over a 30-year period and I was to get 5%, it would seem like a small difference, right? But I'd probably have double or triple what you'd have at the end of the 30 years, which, which seems counterintuitive. And so it is those small little things that day after day after day, they compound in your life. And exactly. I think – you know, my, my niece just got a great job. She just graduated from the University of Michigan, which is kind of our family schools where I went as well. And she was telling me- Old blues. There you go. And she's telling me how she got the job is that she, she met, she had a, a friend in, in, in college who on move-in day, whose father was there. And she just started talking to the dad after she had gone running. And, and the father- after this conversation said, I, I like this kid. I like Eliza. She's a nice kid. She's impressed me. Tell her to email me her resume. And she didn't know who this guy was. He was just, mm-hmm. and, and it turned out he was a lawyer in Chicago whose brother runs a major uh, well, uh, Wall Street firm and got her an interview there. And then she got the job. And she had no idea who this guy was. She didn't know anything about him. She didn't know anything about the brother, any of it. But because she engaged this gentleman in a conversation and talked to him and he was curious about her and she was curious about him. She presented well. Now she has a great job. Aggregation of little things. Yeah. Well, in a LinkedIn post I posted today, I sort of went off a little bit of a rant. One of my pet peeves in sales and applies to this exactly is, and this is a, it's a male salesperson that who does this is Call somebody like me. They had somebody call me up, go have a conversation, and at some point or multiple points during the conversation, they refer to me as buddy or pal. <laughs> it drives me nuts. I mean, for a variety of reasons. One is it's just lazy behavior, um, but it's it's also yeah. I think it talks down to people to some degree. You know, it shows they didn't. I mean, if a twenty year old salesperson is calling me and I'm in my sixties. Why are they going to call me buddy? <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, you're just not matching your language to the person you're speaking to. But it's those small things that make a big difference. To me, they're disqualifiers. If I'm talking to a salesperson that's trying to sell me something and they use that language, we're done. I, I agree with you. And I, I think it's, it's, it's disrespectful. And it's also, um, you know, in my kind of parlance of warmth, I, I think yes. I, I use it as a synonym in some respects for trust. And I think, you know, I'm having the exact same reaction. I'm not even you. I didn't experience this buddy thing that you experienced, but I'm having the same reaction viscerally that, that you had. I'm, I'm just kind of feeling how you feel. And I, I, I'm, I'm recoiling from the word that you used in reference to this because it's, it's a falsifying a sense of trust. And there's nothing mm-hmm. worse than trying to falsely gain someone's trust. It's, 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 to me, it's like the worst thing you can do to somebody. And you can pull it off, obviously. But you recognized it for what it was. It's a game, and you don't want to be in that game. You, you want to have trusting relationships with people that have earned it, not someone in five minutes who's you know, familiarizing yourself with you to try to trick you. 
Yeah, the false intimacy is is uh, yeah, I equated it to nails on a chalkboard uh, reaction. So let's let's dive into your authority warmth energy just so I would give people a sense so they can buy the book and read more about it. But so your awe is A is authority. So define authority. So authority is now remember, my book is about again the people that have substance, right? If you if you if you have the substantive authority in your life, you know how to do the job at hand. That's not enough. So it's about the stylistic authority. It's about the perception of competence that you have, the perception that you can be handed a job or a task that might have influence over other people. And so it's in your voice. It's in your body language. It's in your emotional commitment to your own words. It's in your eye contact that you make with someone. It's in the inflection in, in which you speak. It's in your physicality. So all these things are going to be an in, in indicator of your authority and you know, you could also talk about confidence. Part of it is confidence, of course. Sure. But but these are just, you know, watchwords to – because I think we're – like I said before, we're all making judgments about each other. And you may be the greatest X at what you do. But if you hem and haw – and I use an example of a dentist in the book because we've all been to the dentist and, you know, needing a root canal – and, and, and you go to this one guy and he tells you that 17 different ways he can do a root canal and the 17 different ways he's done it in the past. And there's all these variables to consider and your head is spinning and you just don't want to be around this guy anymore. And then you go to the other dentist and he or she tells you, look, I've done this, this, I've done a thousand root canals. I did 50 this week alone. Uh, you're going to be put out and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to numb you. And in an hour, you're going to be perfect. And that's the person that shows a lot of authority and you want to, you want to put yourself in that person's hands and, and you don't know whether person A or person B is actually better, but you're really judging them based on their style. Yeah. And these, these perceptions are so powerful. And when I, in researching my second book, I was writing as doing research into this whole idea of science of perception. And what this fascinating thing was is that, you know, people quickly form perceptions of somebody they meet for the first time or encounter for the first time. And what the research has shown is that these perceptions are so sticky that even when people are confronted with facts that contradict the perception, they tend not to let the perception go that they formed initially. So all these points you raise about you know the way that you the things you way you present yourself and the language you use and so on is if you're not conscious of it and you sort of accidentally misrepresent yourself unintentionally, uh, it's going to stick, even though you may be extremely competent, maybe the best fit for what this person needs or whatever. If you don't make that good first impression, you could be out the door. Right. And I think there's so many people in this world, and maybe some people who are listening to this, who use too many filler words, or they have this bad habit of their eyes dart away when they're making a point to another person when they're speaking. And mm -hmm. these are just two of many little communication, self-sabotaging behaviors that you could be doing. And unless you become aware of them, you're constantly reinforcing your own mediocrity in this world. And that's unfortunate because you're working hard, you are competent, you do have the authority substantively, you worked hard, but yet stylistically, you're killing yourself. And I think it's such a shame. Right. And when you're talking about little things, and this, to the point you just made, you talk about your voice, right? It's your pitch, pace, and what was the V? I your forgot. volume. Your volume, right. Is I've coached people and actually sent people to, to get training on their voice. So people that are extremely competent people, but their voice was holding them back. And you tend to think, well, this is just the way I am. And it's like, no, this is having an impact. I had one guy that worked for me that it was it, his voice sounded like it was a struggle to come out of his mouth. Right, some like is mm -hmm. stuck in his throat somewhere. Yet extremely capable individual, and for him it was it was a matter of actually in his case doing Toastmasters for a year, just enabled him to relax. It was like a different person. Right, and you 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 changed that guy's life just by setting in. You were the catalyst that set in motion these relatively small things in his life, and I'm sure he's succeeding beyond. Anywhere where he would have been without that. Yeah. And I've, we early in the show, I've, 
early, maybe in the first hundred episodes of, of, the, of the 800 plus we have here, I interviewed a woman who whose business is working with salespeople just on their vocal usage, I guess, is the best way of saying it is, right? Tone of voice, everything, because it's part of this first impression. Right, right. And, and look, I, I think it's part of your second impression and your third impression to your point earlier about how you solidify these perceptions, even if you change it. And look, the, the one thing the research shows that I relied on in the book is that only 15% of your success professionally is correlated and causally related to how good you are at the technical part of your job. And so the way I see it- Hard, I, hard, hard skills. Yeah, hard skills. And, and, and the way I perceive that is that it doesn't mean you don't have to be good at the hard skills. You do have to be good at them. But almost anyone you're competing against in your job is also good enough at the hard skills. So that's not right. going to be the differentiator. The differentiator is- you know, like I said, trust and perception of competence, which is authority, or, you know, the E is energy and how you energize other people. And so those are the things that can't be commoditized, those feelings people have for you. Yeah, I, I tell folks this, that there's sort of this universal question that everybody has to answer repeatedly throughout their, their professional lives and their personal lives, which is when someone meets you and is – the question they ask is, why you? Right? Why should I invest my money with you? Why should I invest my time with you? Why should we become friends? I go down the list of questions that have to do with almost every interpersonal situation, whether it's business or, or on a personal level. And you have to answer that question for that person. Right? And it's not based on how you verbalize that answer. It's based on how they experience you. And these things you talk about, the authority, the warmth, the energy, is just that sums up how people experience you. Right, right, exactly. It's it's true. And and look, one one of the things what made me want to write this book ultimately is not that I mean, look, people have been thinking about these topics for a long time, but I I, I think that what fascinated me in my career, you know, most of my life, and I still am a talent agent for broadcasters, is that. I sort of felt like I had a front row seat to seeing which people actually do reach their potential, relatively speaking, which ones don't. And the ones that didn't just didn't dedicate any resources to this. Mm -hmm. and, and the ones that did, did. And I think it is a microcosm of the larger society. You know, and I, again, I think about the successful dentist. You put, you know, you talk about why are some dentists really successful versus others? I don't think it's just about their work product. I think it's about their ability to engender trust with the patients and have those patients who like them and like like their energetic vibe, then they're recommending other patients. It's true of any – look, I know your podcast focuses a lot on sales uh, or all on sales, but – you know, my view on, and I've been in sales, you know, as an agent, like I said, for almost 30 years now, I think the, the most effective way to be good at sales is to get referrals and also to maintain the customer base that you have. And I think mm -hmm. that, that, right. that happens through this awe, you know, kind of process, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I completely agree with that research that talked about the 85-15 split. 85 is really the soft skills. You know, I look back at my own career, people... You know, ask how was I so successful and what I was selling, and I worked in extremely complex technical fields without a shred of technical training, basically. And a history major in college, selling you know large complex satellite communication systems. Well, that wasn't you know that wasn't the question people were asking about why me, right? It was me personally. Why should they buy from me? was about the 85%, was about the soft skills. was engaging at a human level with people, being curious and extremely interested in, in learning about what what they were confronting, what they were trying, the problems they were trying to solve, the ways that perhaps they hadn't examined before that we could help them that they, they desperately needed. But it's all that soft skills. Right, right. And it's not that I was completely unmindful of the technology and so on. Yeah, I was a smart guy. I learned that as a lay person. But it was. It boiled down to the interpersonal, the human level of things, the human aspect of things, and that's. I think part of the reason I enjoyed the book so much is just that you give so many examples of again the small things that make an outsized difference. Right, and you the way you're describing your career, it's it's just 
it fits in exactly with the narrative is that people wanted to do business with you because you wanted first to understand them. And when they realized that you were going to take the time to want to understand their problems and then put the time in to figure out a solution and make the application for whatever product you had for their solution, that's all people want. And I think to me, that's what the best salespeople do. And obviously, you are a great salesman and you've been an expert on it, talking about it, lecturing on it, etc. So, you know, it's undisputable. Well, I love the quote you had in the book is from uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, uh, who unfortunately has taken fire these days, but um, is this quote talking about when he went and met with the troops out in the field. And he said, the quote was, this is my challenge as a very senior guy. What I've learned over time is that what's most important is not what I say, but my interaction with the audience, which sort of I like and it you know, echoes you know, the famous Maya Angelou quote about, you know, people, you know, paraphrasing, people will never remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Right, right, which is in the book, too. And, you know, I got the chance to spend some time with Admiral Mullen, and I have to say, he completely changed my perception of everything that I thought, ignorantly, frankly, about senior military leaders. I mean, this is a guy who Honestly, he's a lot like you. He he's he seeks first to understand other people. He's very curious. He's inquisitive and interested. And he has seemingly a very small ego, if at, if at all, and very oriented towards serving other people and obviously serving his country. And yep. I don't think a human being could be that good of an actor. I think he truly is a very special person both in his character, to your point, and also the way it reflect his communication reflects his character. Yeah, I, I have really had the good fortune twice in my career to work for uh, ex-military people. They hadn't been senior officers like like Muck, but they'd been um, you know commander level in the, the Navy and so on. And best managers I ever worked for. I don't think uh, it, I was like you. I was shocked just at how well they were trained in, you know, called man management, but you know, people management. Um, yeah, very impressive, and yeah, it changed my mind at that time too. It's like, and I think that the military gives a tremendous amount of thought to how to do this. You know, one of Charles Duhigg's books, he talks about how the military goes to great lengths to to train soldiers. Uh, to you know, take responsibility for their decisions because they know that if they take ownership of their decisions, they end up making better decisions. Uh, and it's it's yeah, I, I find that military is very foresightful oftentimes in some of that stuff. Yeah, I agree. That's been my experience too. And so, I, one last thing I want to bring up, which I thought was a great and sort of painful metaphor, but uh, you talk about you have to be. You have to have intellectual humility in order to succeed. You know, we, we talk about humility being important and vulnerability, but I, I, I categorize that, into that humility as intellectual humility, as, as being able to admit what you don't know sort of the, and take action on it, sort of the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And, and you present an you know, interesting warning about that as, as you sort of equated it to sort of going through life Assuming things are okay, and then you learn too late that it's it's too late is sort of this idea of creating, you know, equating it to cancer. And I think it's a sort of interesting way for people to sort of keep in mind is that, yeah, you know, there's no staying still. Something's always changing, and you have to be aware of what that is. Yeah, I, I, it's funny. After I wrote that, I then subsequently learned that that Winston Churchill had said something similar about eighty years earlier about you know this metaphor for being sick mm-hmm. through the lack of feedback. And I think that, look, I, I just hope that people, if, if they read the book, hear this podcast, just have a little bit of a mindset shift. That's it. It's, 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 on, it's just asking you to think about your life in a slightly different way to realize that, you know, Andy Grove wrote that book, Only the Paranoid Survive. Right. I, and I'm not, say, I'm not saying be paranoid, but but have a little bit of a healthy paranoia about the fact that there may be something out there about you that you could be improving at every moment. And I think there is, I mean, 
for myself included. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and look, the way I look at it also is that if you are lucky enough to live as long as you live, you should hope that until the day you die, there is still something you should be improving. Me, that's the point of life or one of the points of life is this idea of continuously trying to grow and improve in every aspect of who you are. Yeah, and reinventing yourself. I mean, that's that's how I'd look at it. I mean, I see sort of like, I count it like seven different times during my career and life that I consciously took steps to move in a different direction, to take on the challenge, to learn new things, to yeah, continue to evolve. Yeah. And if, I think if you don't do that, uh, then, yeah, you fall prey to becoming obsolete and having your sell-by date moved up much sooner than you want it it's a good way to put it so all right steve thank you so much for joining me this has been a lot of fun and i really enjoyed the book recommend people read it Uh, again that is don't take yes for an answer using authority warmth and energy to get exceptional results so if people want to learn more about you and connect with you how can they do that just go to my website www.stevenherz.com s-t-e-v-e-n-h-e-r-z.com and you can follow me on you know, all these various social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, but not TikTok. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not on TikTok yet. I'm not hip enough. <laughs> I'm definitely not hip enough. So, uh, yeah, you're not going to see me there. LinkedIn. All right, Steve, thank you so much. Andy, great to talk to you. Have a great day. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen. We're always grateful for your support of this program. And I want to thank my guest, Steve Hers for sharing his wisdom with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you can also leave us a rating or a review, let us know how we're doing. Well, we'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you again for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com/platform. That's ringdna.com/platform.